Finally, everyone, welcome back to another video. We're looking, at continuing our discussion of oxidizing and reducing agents. And I want us to think about how that corresponds to the activity series. Um, you think about it, something that you used when we looked at single replacement reactions and determined whether or not a reaction would actually take place. But with our understanding of redox reactions and oxidizing and reducing agents, we can really start to think of the activity series as really showing us how easy or difficult it would be for a substance to undergo oxidation or reduction, depending on what it is that we're looking at. So excited that you're here with me. Let's uh, go ahead and bark on this journey. It's going to be fun. So remember, we, we talked about oxidizing and reducing agents. Remember, your oxidizing agent is the substance that's reduced, and your reducing agent is the substance that's oxidized. Well, when it comes to this, just like most things in chemistry, not all oxidizing and reducing agents are going to have the same strength. And so there has to be a way for us to rank them or organize them so that we can show that increasing strength. And so that's really where the activity series really comes into play. Now, their strength in terms of oxidation, oxidation, oxidizing and reducing agents is going to depend on how easily they gain or lose electrons, right? So for our reducing agents, our reducing agents tend to be metals because they tend to give up electrons. Remember, a reducing agent is something that is being oxidized. And we think about our elements on the periodic table, our metals tend to form positive ions very readily. So metals tend to give up electrons forming positive ions, so they cause other elements to become more negative or to be reduced, right? So like in sodium chloride, Na forms that positive one charge. It's essentially um, helping to um, reduce the chlorine, right? Chlorine goes from zero to minus one when it forms chloride. It's helping the chloride gain that electron. So our metals tend to be really good reducing agents, right? So this is why metals are commonly reducing agents. And the more reactive the metal is, um, so that means how easily it loses those electrons, the more readily and the stronger it is as a reducing agent. Okay, so obviously think of the metal reactivity um, a, a, as an insight as to whether or not it's going to be a, a good reducing agent or not. And so more reactive metals lose their electrons more readily, so they're going to behave and going to act as stronger reducing agents. Right? They're going to be oxidized much more easily than other metals. Now, this is just a small portion of the activity series. This is not the entire thing, right? But what this is showing us, you've got magnesium, aluminum, zinc, iron, lead, copper, and silver. And so our strongest reducing agent in this particular list is what's at the top, right? So when we look at these, magnesium is going to be the substance that most easily or most readily loses electrons, right? And so that means that magnesium, if it were in a process, would be able to replace any of these other elements in a compound, right? So if magnesium and aluminum chloride, magnesium could replace the aluminum and aluminum chloride so that MgCl2 would be formed, magnesium chloride, and then aluminum metal would be produced, right? And so as we go down that list, we get weaker and weaker reducing agents. So that means it's harder or it's not as straightforward or not as favorable for it to be oxidized. So for example, like copper and silver, right? So you think about copper and silver, they get used in um, a lot of wires, um, definitely gold for sure. And so it would be a problem if in your wire, you have those metals that are losing their electrons rather than allowing the electrons to flow through them, right? And so um, that means it would not be as easy or copper and silver are not gonna readily be oxidized. So that means the silver and copper couldn't replace um, magnesium if magnesium was in a solution, for example, right? And so again, remember the way the activity series works, the substance that's at the top, anything that's below it, it can replace. Um, so in this case, silver 
couldn't replace anything on this list because it, it is not readily oxidized um, as opposed to some of these other metals that are present. Now, let's look at our oxidizing agents, right? So remember, oxidizing agent, this is the substance that's being reduced. Now, your oxidizing agents, your good ones at least, tend to be your nonmetals. And this is because nonmetals tend to gain electrons. And when they gain electrons, they form those negative ions. And as a result, they can cause other elements to become more positive or to be oxidized, right? If we go back to the Na, the sodium, and the chlorine example, right? Chlorine works really well here because chlorine really wants to gain an electron. And when it gains an electron, it's reduced, but that means that it had to gain the electron from somewhere, which meant that the other element lost an electron. So your nonmetals tend to be very good oxidizing agents. These are the common ones, but again, we need to keep in mind that we can have instances where metals can be oxidizing agents, um, and likewise, you can have nonmetals being reducing agents, but the circumstances for that are going to be very unique. Now, the more reactive the nonmetal, just like what we saw previously, um, so the more reactive the nonmetal is, it gains electrons more readily. So then it's going to be a stronger oxidizing agent, right? It's going to be a substance that is going to want to cause other elements to lose their electrons. So let's just take a look at a small sample of a activity series based on these reactive nonmetals, right? And so you should probably remember this from Honors Chem. You, you take the halogens, you've got fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And again, fluorine up at the top is our strongest oxidizing agent. It's the most electronegative element, so it is most readily reduced in processes. It wants to gain electrons. Whereas as we move down that list, and you can kind of see this as a function of um, periodic trends and atomic radius and Coulomb's law, that I2 is the weakest oxidizing agent of the bunch, right? It's at the bottom. It can't replace anything else that's above it. Um, in a solution, so it wouldn't be as easily reduced as those other substances that have been listed. Now, keep in mind, you're not gonna have to memorize the activity series, but the thing that you're gonna have to think about is you should be able to interpret information from one. So not only is it something that just helps you know whether or not a single replacement reaction is going to take place, but it's telling you something about its ability to be oxidized or reduced when you start to look at it. So remember that any metal or nonmetal above another will cause a displacement reaction, those single replacement reactions. And if it's not higher on the activity series, the reaction won't occur. And so let's say that you were given a series of viable chemical reactions, then what you would need to be able to do is determine the activity series within that particular set of reactions, right? Based on how the process is proceeding, you'd be able to figure out, okay, this is the better oxidizing agent, this is the better reducing agent because of X, Y, and Z information according to these series of chemical reactions, okay? Now, hopefully that gives you guys some more insight as to how we can use that oxidizing and reducing agent information and even in terms of identifying strength of an oxidizing or a reducing agent. So thank you so much for joining me, and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again real soon.